the charioteer what happened at the park that caused the prince to be upset. Charioteer told the king what Prince Vipassi saw. Fearing that the prophecy of the prince going into the homeless life and becoming a Buddha will come true, the king provided for Prince Vipassi to have even more enjoyment of the fivefold sense pleasures, in order that he should rule the kingdom as a universal monarch. Thus the prince continued to live indulging in, and addicted to the fivefold sense pleasures. After many years, hundreds of thousands of years later, Prince Vipassi said to his charioteer to bring him to the pleasure park to inspect it. When he arrived at the park, Prince Vipassi saw a large crowd clad in many colors and carrying a coffin. At the sight of this sight, he asked the charioteer what are they doing? The charioteer explained that they are carrying a dead man. Prince went to have a better look at the corpse and asked why he was called a dead man. The charioteer said he is dead because now his parents and relatives will not see him again and he can't see them again. Then the prince asked if he will die one day and will he not be exempted from death too? The charioteer that no one can escape from death. After returning to his palace, Prince Vipassi was overwhelmed by grief and dejection as he thinks birth will lead to death. The king Band Huma asked the charioteer what happened at the park that caused the prince to be upset. Charioteer told the king what Prince Vipassi saw. Fearing that the prophecy of the prince going into the homeless life and becoming a Buddha will come true, the king provided for Prince Vipassi to have even more enjoyment of the fivefold sense pleasures, in order that he should rule the kingdom as a universal monarch. Thus the prince continued to live indulging in, and addicted to the fivefold sense pleasures. After many years, hundreds of thousands of years later, Prince Vipassi said to his charioteer to bring him to the pleasure park to inspect it. When he arrived at the park, Prince Vipassi saw a shaven-headed, who has gone forth into monkshood and wearing a yellow robe. At the sight of this sight, he asked the charioteer why this man does not look like others, what's wrong with him? The charioteer explained that he is a monk who follows the Dhamma, lives in serenity, does good actions, performs meritorious deeds, harmless and truly has compassion for all living beings. Prince went to have a better understanding what a monk is and spoke to the monk. Prince Vipassi told the charioteer to take the carriage and drive back to the palace, but he stayed back, shaved off his hair and beard, put on yellow robes and go forth from the household life. Into homelessness. Then a great crowd from the royal capital city, Bondhumity, 84,000 people gathered after they heard that Prince Vipassi had gone forth into monkshood. They thought, this is certainly no common teaching and discipline, certainly not common for Prince Vipassi to become a monk. If the prince has done so, why should not we? And so, these 84,000 people shaved off their hair and beards and donned yellow robes, followed the Bodhisattva Vipassi into monkshood. Following the Bodhisattva Vipassi they went on alms rounds through villages, towns, and royal cities. Then the Bodhisattva Vipassi thought that he should not be in a crowd like this and went into solitude seclusion. He thought, this world is in a sorry state, there is birth and decay, there is death and rebirth again and again, samsara. And no one knows any way of escape from this suffering, this aging and this death. When will deliverance be found from this suffering, this aging? and death? What brings about aging and death? Then it dawned on him and he realized the dependent origination, the cause and effect because of birth being present, aging and death occurs, birth conditions aging and death. Then Bodhisattva Vipassi realized the twelve links of dependent origination in reverse order. What conditions aging and death, birth? What conditions birth, becoming? What conditions becoming, clinging? What conditions clinging, cravings? What conditions craving, feelings? What conditions feelings, contact? What conditions contact, six sense spheres? What conditions six sense spheres, mind and body? What conditions mind and body, consciousness? What conditions consciousness, volitional formations? What conditions volitional formations, ignorance? Dependent origination have 12 links which are interlinked, 
it analyzes the causes and conditions that lead to samsaric life, rebirth. In this world there is a cause for everything that happens. When the cause is removed the effect ceases. The cause of suffering in samsara and the eradication of such suffering are explained in accordance with dependent origination. Whenever this is present, this is also present. Whenever this is absent, this is also absent. From the arising of this, this arises. From the cessation of this, this ceases to be. Then Bodhisattva Vipassi realized the cessation of suffering roots in the eradication of the cause of each link. With the cessation of birth and gt aging and death ceases. With the cessation of becoming and gt birth ceases. With the cessation of clinging and gt becoming ceases. With the cessation of craving and gt clinging ceases. With the cessation of feelings and gt craving ceases. With the cessation of contact and gt feeling ceases. With the cessation of six sense spheres and gt contact ceases. With the cessation of mind and body and gt six sense sphere ceases. With the cessation of consciousness and gt mind and body ceases. With the cessation of volitional formations and gt consciousness ceases. With the cessation of ignorance and gt volitional formation cease. Cessation, cessation, there arose in Bodhisattva Vipassi with insight into things never realized before, knowledge, vision, awareness and light. He developed insight and wisdom. Then the Bodhisattva Vipassi dwelt contemplating the rise and fall of the five aggregates of clinging namely the body, the feeling, perception, the mental formations and consciousness, their arising and passing away. As he remained contemplating the rise and fall of the five aggregates of clinging, before long his mind was freed from the corruptions without remainder and he became enlightened. After Buddha Vipassi became an arahant, a fully enlightened Buddha, he thought that he has realized this Dhamma which is profound, hard to grasp, peaceful, excellent, beyond reasoning and to be apprehended by the wise. But should he teach this Dhamma, he pondered as he thinks that the people are so delighted in clinging and would not understand dependent origination. He thought, those delighted in this clinging and craving will find it hard to calm all the mental formations, the abandonment of all substrates of rebirth, the waning of craving, dispassion, cessation, and nibbana. And if I were to teach Dhamma to others and they did not understand me, that would be a weariness and a trouble to me. Buddha Vipassi uttered this phrase. This that I've attained, why should I proclaim? Those full of lust and hate can never grasp it. Leading upstream this Dhamma, subtle, deep. Hard to see, no passion blinded folk can see. It. Then a certain great Brahma sensed that Buddha Vipassi is inclined to inaction rather than teaching the Dhamma. He thought the world is perishing and will be destroyed if Buddha Vipassi does not preach the Dhamma that will benefit people. So in a swift, the great Brahma appeared before Buddha Vipassi and said, May the Blessed One teach the Dhamma, may the Welfarer teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust on their eyes who are perishing through not hearing Dhamma, they will become knowers of Dhamma, there are people who can understand the Dhamma. Then Buddha Vipassi explained why he does not want to teach the Dhamma. Two more times Brahma appeared to persuade Buddha Vipassi to teach. At the third time, Buddha Vipassi recognized Brahma's appeal and was moved by compassion for beings. He surveyed the world with his Buddha eye. And he saw beings with little dust on their eyes and with much dust, with faculties sharp and dull, of good and bad disposition, easy and hard to teach, and a few of them living in fear of transgression and of the next world. And just as in a pool of blue, red, or white lotuses some are born in the water, grow in the water and, not leaving the water, thrive in the water, some are born in the water and reach the reach the surface, while some, having reached the surface, grow out of the water and are not polluted by it. Then Buddha Vipassi was convinced that there are people out there who could understand the Dhamma and will benefit from it. Then knowing his thought, the great Brahma addressed the Buddha Vipassi in these verses. As on a mountain peak a watcher sees the folk below. So, man of wisdom, seeing all, look down from Dhamma heights. 
free from woe, look on those who are sunk in grief, oppressed with birth and age. Arise, hero, victor in battle, leader of the caravan, traverse the world. Teach, O Lord, the Dhamma, and they will understand. Buddha Vipassi replied to the great Brahma in these verses. Open to them are the deathless doors. Path to enlightenment. Let those that hear now put forth faith. For fear of trouble I did not preach at first. The excellent Dhamma for men, Brahma. Buddha Vipassi thought, to whom should I? First teach this Dhamma? Who would understand it quickly? Then he thought of Kanda the king's son and Tissa the chaplain's son, living in the capital city of Bandhumati. They are wise, learned, experienced, and for a long time have had little dust on their eyes, they will understand it quickly. Then Buddha Vipassi went to the deer park of Kima and he taught Kanda and Tissa a graduated discourse on generosity, on morality, and on heaven, showing the danger, degradation, and corruption of sense desires, and the profit of renunciation. And when Buddha Vipassi knew that the minds of Kanda and Tissa were ready, pliable, free from the hindrances, joyful and calm, then he preached the Buddha's special discourse in brief, on sufferings, its origin, its cessation, and the path. And just as a clean cloth from which all stains have been removed receives the dye perfectly, so in Prince Kanda and Tissa, the chaplain's son, as they sat there, there arose the pure and spotless Dhamma I, and they knew, whatever things have an origin must come to cessation. Both Kanda and Tissa having seen, attained, experienced, and penetrated the Dhamma, having passed beyond doubt, having gained perfect confidence in the teacher's doctrine without relying on others, said, Excellent Lord, excellent. It is as if someone were to set up what had been knocked down, or to point out the way to one who had got lost, or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place so that those with eyes could see what was there. Just so, the Blessed One has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. We go for refuge to the Blessed One and to the Dhamma. May we receive the go forth and receive ordination. After ordination, Buddha Vipassi instructed them with a discourse on Dhamma, inspired them and delighted them, showing the danger, degradation, and corruption of conditioned things and the profit of Nibbana. And through their being inspired, fired, and delighted with this discourse, it was not long before their mind was free from the corruptions without remainder and they attained the fruits of enlightenment. Then a great crowd of 84,000 heard that Buddha Vipassi and that two respectable men Kanda and Tissa had gone forth to become a monk, so they went to the deer park to pay respect and sat down to listen to the teachings of Buddha Vipassi. After hearing the graduated discourse, these 84,000 people also developed the pure and spotless Dhamma I, they understood the teachings and they knew whatever things have an origin must come to cessation. They too received ordination and become monks. After hearing more teachings from Buddha Vipassi they too had their minds free from corruption without remainder. During that time, at the capital of Bandhumati, there was a vast gathering of 6,800,000 monks. When Buddha Vipassi went into seclusion, he thought wouldn't it be wonderful if I asked the monks to go out for the happiness and out of compassion of the world, for the welfare and happiness of devas and humans to teach them the Dhamma. I will ask them not to go in pairs to teach this Dhamma that is lovely in the beginning, lovely in the middle and lovely in the end, displaying the holy life fully complete and perfect. Here are beings with little dust on their eyes who are perishing through not hearing Dhamma, they will become knowers of Dhamma. There will people who will benefit from these teachings and show them the path to enlightenment. This noble thought was made known to a great Brahma who encouraged the Buddha Vipassi to send his monks out to teach the lay people and spread the teachings far and wide. Buddha concurred and told the monks to come back to the royal capital of Banjamati at the end of six years to recite the disciplinary code. After six years of wandering and spreading the Dhamma, the monks returned to Banjamati. Then Buddha Vipassi told the monks to follow the precepts. Patient forbearance is the highest sacrifice. Supreme is Nibbana, so say the Buddhas. He's not one gone forth who hurts others, do not kill and harm. No ascetic, he who harms another. 
not to do any evil but to cultivate the good. To purify one's mind, this the Buddha's teaching. Not insulting, not harming, restraint according to rule. Moderation in food, seclusion of dwelling, do not overindulge. Devotion to high thinking, this the Buddha's teach. Buddha continued, once, monks, I was staying Akatha in the Subhaga grove at the foot of a great sal tree. As I dwelt there in seclusion it occurred to me, the devas of the pure abodes have not been visited and not been taught the Dhamma for so long. Suppose I were to visit them now? And then Buddha vanished from Akatha and appeared among the Aviha devas. And many thousands of the devas came to me, saluted me, and stood to one side. Then they said, Sir, it is ninety-one. Eons since the Buddha Vipassi appeared in the world. And we, Sir, who lived the holy life under the Buddha Vipassi, having freed ourselves from sense desires, have arisen here. They narrated the lineage and history of Buddha Vipassi to me. Then the devas continued and said, Sir, in this fortunate eon, now the Lord Buddha has arisen in the world, he was born of the Kadiya race and arose in a Kadiya family, he was of the Gotama clan, in his time the lifespan is short, limited, and quick to pass, it is seldom that anybody lives to be a hundred. He gained his full enlightenment under an asset the tree, he has a pair of noble disciples, Saraput and Magalana, he has one assembly of disciples, 1250 monks, who are all Arahants, his chief personal attendant is Ananda, his father is King Sadodana, his mother was Queen Maya, and his father's royal capital is Kapalavatthu. Such was the Lord's renunciation, such his going forth, such his striving, such his full enlightenment, such his turning of the wheel. And we sir, who have lived the holy life under the Lord, having freed ourselves from sense desires, have arisen here. Then Buddha went with the Aviha Devas to see the Atapa Devas, and with these to see the Sudasa Devas, and with these to see the Sudasi Devas, and with all of these to see the Akinadtha Devas. And there many thousands of Devas came, saluted to Buddha and stood to one side, saying, Sir, it has been ninety-one eons since the Buddha Vipassi appeared in the world. Buddha Vipassi's renunciation was like this, his going forth like this, his striving like this, his full enlightenment like this, his turning of the will like this. And in this fortunate eon, now the Lord Buddha has arisen in the world. Such was the Lord's renunciation, such going forth, such his striving, such his full enlightenment, such his turning of the wheel. And we sir, who have lived the holy life under the Lord, having freed ourselves from sense desires, have arisen here. Buddha, and so it is, monks, that by his penetration of the fundamentals of Dhamma, the Tathagata remembers the past Buddhas who have attained final Nibbana, have passed by all suffering, he recalls their births, their names, their clan, their lifespan, their twin disciples, their assemblies of disciples. He recalls how the past Buddhas were born, what they were called, what's their clan, thus was their morality, their Dhamma, their wisdom, their dwelling, thus was their liberation. At the end of this discourse given by the monks were delighted and rejoiced at his words. In other words, this discourse talks about the past lives focusing on past Buddhas, their birth, their family, their names, their clans, their renunciation, their enlightenment, their disciples, and their Dhamma. By WHH. References. 1 www.accesstoinsight.org. 2 https colon.